So, happy Friday, everybody. Today, the Canadian government uh, introduced new regulation uh, to ban all AR-15s, uh, all AR-15 type variants, and what they call assault style rifles or assault style weapons. Let's go through a couple of the things and, and kind of set the record straight because a lot of people don't really know. How do you sift through the BS? How do you sift through all the different rules, regulations, laws uh, that govern these firearms to begin with? Um, I get a lot of questions from a lot of people all the time, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're talking straight in facts. There's, this is a feelings-free zone. I have a lot of feelings about this, but I will not be talking about my feelings. Let's talk about the facts. The facts are point number one. The firearms that were banned today are not assault weapons. They are not assault rifles. I dare anybody who questions that to actually take one into a war zone and see how long they last. If you take it into battle, you will die very, very quickly. Here's why. There's no such thing as an actual assault rifle by legal definition in Canada. The only legal definition in the world that has ever been set has been done by the FBI down in the US. And they, they basically say that, amongst other things like just form factor and pistol grip and interchangeable magazine, like the t detachable mag, uh, the firearm actually must function like this in order to qualify as an assault weapon. weapon. So it actually has to have select fire capability. So the little side toggle switch that we have on our semi-autos and, and the AR-15 especially is a safe or a fire option. For it to qualify as an assault rifle or an assault weapon or an assault style rifle, whatever the hell that means, it actually has to have select fire capability, meaning from safe to burst fire to single shot fire and full automatic. That is it. The AR-15 does not meet that legal criteria for, or that legal definition for an assault rifle. So therefore it is not. The 1500 rifles that are on that list are not assault rifles. I dare anybody with any kind of uh, military exp expertise or knowledge to debate me and prove me wrong. An AR-15, the second point is an AR-15 is a semi-auto centered fired cartridge typically chambered in 5.56 NATO or 2.23 Remington. Um, meaning it's semi-auto, so one trigger pull, one round down range like I've talked about before. Uh, it's not a fully automatic killing machine and people try to make it out to be that. It is not that. The second most important point for Canadians is that this rifle and all center-fired semi-automatic rifles in Canada have a magazine capacity of five rounds. Not 30, not 500, not 300, it's five. In Canada, this is a restricted firearm, meaning that you have to hold a restricted possession and acquisition license or an RPAL that is issued by the Canadian Mounted Police after you complete a firearm safety course. It's a two day course with a written test and a practical exam at the end of the course. You have to prove that you're capable, that you can know how to safely handle it, that you know how to safely store it and safely transport it. We have very, very strict restrictions on this. On top of that, once you complete that course, you actually have to submit your application, which lists out a myriad of different things that you have to qualify for, meaning you have, can't have any uh, mental health or uh, violent history. You can't have a criminal record, generally speaking. You, can't, um, you, you have to get permission from a spouse or a conjugal partner, and you actually have to get two different reference checks. And you have to list all these different people and their contact information, and the RCMP calls them, as well as running a police background check on you that, that particular time before they issue the license. It can take anywhere from four to 12 months to get your license. That's how long it takes in Canada to be able to eligible to even buy the stupid thing in the first place. On top of that, now that you have it, it takes another probably month and a half process to just buy it the first time you buy a restricted firearm. And it's only, can be, it can only be used in an RCMP approved shooting range and for only target shooting purposes. So you can only take it there and back and no, you cannot stop anywhere in between in the meantime. It has to be double locked with a trigger lock and a hard case that's locked and separate from ammunition and all those different things. It can only be used for target shooting and action shooting sports like three gun, multi gun uh, and those shooting competitions. The second point that I want to make about the AR-15 or this particular cartridge, the 223-556 NATO, is that you cannot hunt any big game with it. It's way, way, way too small of a caliber. It's a 22 caliber round. 
You cannot hunt it for any deer, elk, moose. It, for one, it's completely unethical because it would generally not take the animal down in one shot. So therefore, it is prohibited by hunting regulations to be for its use against big game. Um, you cannot hunt with an AR-15 or any of the restricted prohibited or the restricted variants because it's prohibited. You cannot take that weapon or that firearm anywhere outside of an RCMP approved range and your home where you have to safely store it in a safe and, and trigger locked. So saying that, oh, you don't need this uh, to take down a deer, like Justin Trudeau and Bill Burr keep saying, you don't need something like this to take down a deer is a completely asinine statement. For one, you're not allowed to. Secondly, you're not allowed to. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a really weird, it's a massively weak talking point meant for the liberal base. And it's for people who are generally uneducated about our firearms laws. And they don't know what our hunting regulations are. And they generally despise guns and they despise hunting. They want to get rid of both. So I don't know even why I would even make this statement. It's basically a little bit of platitude to the um, all the myriad of firearms owners that do not own any restricted firearms. Basically, your hunters and kind of the old guys that, you know, maybe do some duck hunting or some skeet shooting. And they're like, well, I never need one of those uh, black rifles. I have no interest, so go ahead and ban them. That's who he's trying to feed the red meat to as well. Because they don't know that eventually he's going to come for their shit too. So whatever. The other point I want to make is that people don't generally know this, but legal law abiding gun owners, and that's a very important segment of the population, people who pass the background checks and who get their license, they are generally the most law abiding Canadians and generally the safest Canadians. This is statistically a hard fact. It cannot be disputed. Go check with StatsCan. Go check with your local police department. Go interview any of the police chiefs across the country and they will tell you the exact same thing. Any police officer that has ever dealt with a legal law-abiding Canadian gun owner will tell you the same thing. Their interactions are always, always very positive. These people follow the law because they have to follow the law. We're the only ones that care about the law, so therefore we follow it in order to keep doing what we like to do, whether that's sports shooting, whether that's hunting, whether that's competing, whatever the case may be. On top of all the things that I've already mentioned around having to go through the hoops of getting our firearms license, there's a thing called continuous eligibility screening that we have to go through every single day. That's actually literally a background check that's performed by the Canadian Police Information Center every single day, 24 hours, 365, for however many years you hold your license. That background check gets run against your name. You don't have a choice about it. It's just part of the conditions of being a firearms owner in Canada. On top of that, the RCMP can also, at any point in time, with zero notice, show up at your house, knock on your door with either a SWAT team or whatever behind them, wanting to enter into your house and inspect your firearms. They wanted to make sure that you have what you're supposed to have, that you don't have any firearms that are outside of your uh, classifications that, you, that you're entitled to, uh, that you're st storing them safely, and then you're storing your ammunition safely. Uh, they can knock on my door right now as I'm recording this video and I wouldn't have any choice about it. I would have to let them in by law so they can look at all my farms, look at my safe, look at whatever they want to look at. By law, I, I can't say no, go get a warrant before you come in. Like any other Canadian has the right to do, I cannot refuse them. I will be charged, I will go to jail for two years and all my firearms will disappear and the t thousands of dollars that I invest invested for my competition uh, firearms, gone. That's the other part that I want to talk about too that most people don't know about is that we kind of give up a lot of rights by becoming legally licensed firearms owner in Canada. Convicted felons don't even give up the amount of rights that we do, which is kind of funny if you think about it. Um, we are automatically, as part of our conditions for having the license, subject to a mandatory minimum sentence of two years by summary conviction, meaning that it can be a paper crime, nothing major. I didn't go shoot anybody. I didn't go take my arm, a firearm and I was unsafe in the neighborhood playing in my cul-de-sac or down my street and kind of showing everybody everything and just being just utterly irresponsible with it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a paper crime, which is I forgot my uh, registration certificate with my firearms or I didn't have my ATT little piece of paper that's digitally attached to my license anyway, but I'm also required to have the stupid uh, paper version of it alongside anytime I transport stuff. So maybe it fell out of my range bag when I was cleaning it out or maybe I forgot it at home completely by accident or my dog ate it or moved it on me when she was playing with stuff. I have no idea. But for that and, and reason alone, I can go to jail for two years and be summarily convicted of that two year sentence, meaning I don't get to appear before a jury. There is no trial. A judge just hands me this if it's if he sees he or she sees fit. So 
that's a pretty crazy fact, along with kind of unlawful search and seizure and all sorts of things that go along with being a firearms owner that we're subjected to on a daily basis. Like I say, they don't track convicted felons with a prohibition order that they cannot ever uh, own a firearm. Bill Blair and Justin Trudeau say that when a convicted felon leaves the prison or the justice system, they do not track them, even if they have a firearms prohibition order against them issued by the courts. They don't know where these guys are. They don't care to. They don't check in on them. But we're checked on every single day, 24 hours a day. I think the same case goes against uh, people who are technically like child molesters and pedophiles. They're not as tracked as stringently as we are. We have to notify the RCMP firearms program uh, of any address change 30 days before it occurs, not 30 days after. We have to let them know if we're moving 30 days ahead of time so that our file can be updated and the police can be notified and all these different things. The AR-15 is not an assault rifle. It does not stall a stand for assault rifle 15. None of the variants today have ever been used in any kind of mass killing or mass shooting scenario in Canada. Do not use American stats. Do not use American research. Do not use American gun laws as a way to punish us law-abiding Canadians where our laws are very, very strict in this matter. So using American mass shooting scenarios and talking about Orlando or Las Vegas or whatever the case may be, I don't care. It doesn't apply to us. Their laws are different. It's a different jurisdiction altogether. We are not Americans. We are Canadians. We follow Canadian laws. And I would hope that our politicians would be mindful of Canadian laws and Canadian statistics and Canadian research, which fully back us up, that we are the safest, most law-abiding citizens in the entire country. The stats prove it. They don't lie. The politicians do. One of the things that really hurts me when we talk about the stuff that happened in Nova Scotia is the sheer murder and carnage that took place and was unleashed on the people in Nova Scotia, and my heart breaks for them, honestly. I, I don't even know what to say. I get emotional every time I think about it. Um, <clears throat> it could have been any of us in any province, in any part of the country, in any part of the world for that matter. Um, the problem is they're using this now as a mechanism to turn this tragedy against more Canadians and the people who are generally the safest and most law-abiding, but it doesn't really matter. Um, they want to push this law through. They saw an opportunity and a political opening to do it. They weren't gonna do it before. They said in their um, election campaign for 2019, when they got reelected as a minority government, that they had plans on instituting more tighter gun controls or bans or whatever the hell they were gonna do. The issue is that they didn't have the mandate from Canadians to do that. They got voted in by the skin of their teeth into a minority government. More people actually voted for the, Lib for the Conservatives, for the Conservative Party of Canada than they did for the Liberals, yet the Liberals still one, a minority government. So they weren't gonna do it. They didn't have much of a mandate to begin with, which is why they never mentioned it after they got elected. Forget COVID-19 and the pandemic. That's just a cover story right now. It's like, whoa, why, why are we guys waiting until now? Now they had political cover because there was a major mass killing in this country that occurred in Nova Scotia. And unfortunately, 22 people lost their lives. Um, the one thing to note about that is that not everybody was murdered with a firearm. I think nine, nine of the 21 or 22 victims were murdered by a fire. So they were burned to death, unfortunately, which is tragic to even think about. There were firearms involved. The issue is that this guy was a psychopath. He was hell-bent on destroying people's lives and murdering as many people as he could. He was not a licensed gun owner. He was, in fact, prohibited from owning firearms because he was convicted on an assault charge earlier in the decade or in 2003 or something along those lines, but he was prohibited from owning firearms for a certain period of time. I'm not sure what that was, but he did not have a valid possession and acquisition license. This was confirmed by the RCMP. So let's review the facts around Nova Scotia, which is effectively the incident that they're now using as justification to ban legal firearms owners from owning their legally acquired property and using it at a shooting range that they're, it's only approved for. So not a legal law-abiding licensed gun owner, smuggled, stolen, imported, illegally imported weapons from the U.S. that are completely illegal, illegal in Canada, especially for him because he wasn't licensed to own them. He had a stolen or forfeited or lost RCMP uniform that he was not legally allowed to possess because he was not an RCMP officer. He also had a RCMP insignia police vehicle that he bought in an auction and fixed up or modified, whatever. So he's already broken like four or five laws 
And then, you know, murder is illegal. Arson is illegal. Lots of other things are illegal that he did. Evading police, shooting at people. What in God's name kind of law would stop this kind of guy with a, this much determination? I don't understand what any of these laws are going to do to fix that. And I keep going back to saying that an AR-15 has never, ever been used in a mass shooting in Canada. I don't know what else to say about it. If these facts don't really help you understand the situation, um, the only thing I'm going to say is that this is not meant to reduce any kind of crime in Canada. <clears throat> this is not intended to help Canadians be more safe, unfortunately. Um, the vast majority of shootings occur by gangs and criminals. And this isn't going to have any effect on them. I mean, criminals are going to be doing criminal things. That's what they do. Uh, following, law, following laws is not their forte. They honestly could give a damn what laws we pass. They're not going to follow them. And I mean, if we really want to focus on gun safety, we need to be investing more money in Canadian Border Services Agency to equip them better, to uh, check for smuggled weapons from the United States. We need to be shutting down the known smuggling rings that are unfortunately taking place in a lot of First Nations lands in Quebec, and they know who these are. This has been the same ring that has been illegally smuggling cigarettes and that kind of stuff, and the law enforcement agencies all know where these guys are. There's also smuggling rings uh, from China that import stuff into Vancouver, and I'm sure there's a bunch of guns that come across the border and by our uh, by boat uh, from the United States. <clears throat> and we need to equip our law enforcement agencies to, to shut these down as much as possible. I mean, the biggest firearms market in the world is in the States. And uh, it's very easy to acquire them down there for their citizens. And I'm sure there's a criminal element involved in smuggling those firearms. So let's focus on the people who are the problem and not the people who are who are not the problem and have never been part of the problem and will never be part of the problem. The last point that I'm going to make on this today is that this was done by order and counsel and not by legislation. So this was a very, very sneaky way to get this done. I mean, legally, they can do it. Of course, the government has whatever power uh, to do what, whatever legislation or regulation they want to pass as, as much as the law allows them to. But this is extremely sneaky. So they did this when uh, freedom of assembly has been highly restricted. So we can't go and protest uh, or whatever if people in, in, were so inclined to do so to protect their rights. Um, you can't, because of the a COVID-19 pandemic, you can't go outside, you can't assemble, you can't go protest the government, you can't do anything along those lines. So that's very sneaky for one. They did it when parliament is limited to one session in person per week, and that's by design. And they also requested that no, um, no bills be brought to motion that are not COVID-19 related. So they have three things working in their favor. And then they obviously use the Nova Scotia mass killing, which was highly unfortunate to begin with, um, to try and push this... Basically, it's, it's not even legislation. It's not evidence-based policy like they always want to say. The evidence is, in, unfortunately for them, in our favor, but it doesn't do anything for us. The facts don't matter. It's basically just politics. And this is virtue signaling at its worst. So think about it this way. Right now, they're applying this concept and this whole, we don't think you should own this principle um, to firearms. So fine. If somebody proves to me that my firearms are, in fact, the problem... I will happily give them up if I believe that that'll do something to save lives, to make, keep Canadians safe, and to make a dent in the difference in the crime that happens in this country. I would be the first to hand over all my guns and say, here, if I, I'll do my part, whatever it takes. The problem is the evidence doesn't support that statement. So therefore, I'm against it. But let's say they come out and say, you know, you have a 300 horsepower, horsepower Ducati motorcycle and, you know... Those things, nobody should have to own that. I mean, there's no legal use for that. There's no reasonable justification for you to own a motorcycle that fast. You can go over 300 kilometers an hour. Like, God, that's that's wholly dangerous. You're endangering yourself and all these other Canadians on the road by having something so dangerous in your possession. I mean, you bought it legally with your money. You paid a lot of money for it. You're legally licensed. You legally store it. You maintain it. You belong to clubs. You go racing. You go competing with it. You can do all these different things with a Ducati. But all of a sudden, the government decides, no, we're going to pass an order in council or legislation or whatever to prohibit that particular motorcycle from you because they have now believed through their, you know, elevated thinking that they're better than you. And they say, no, you, you know, we've decided you can't have that anymore. It's just too dangerous for Canadians. And for public safety reasons, we have to ban all motorcycles over 75 horsepower. The same 
argument applies to like sports cars and vehicles and ATVs and boats and whatever else you want to say. So how much power do we want to give to the government for them to decide what we can and cannot legally own as Canadians? I thought we lived in a free country, but apparently we do not. We were subjects of apparently a dictator. So I don't know. Canadians prove me wrong. Next election, let's make sure that these guys get thrown out of government and we have a reasonable evidence-based policy uh, party come into play. And hopefully that is the conservative government at this point. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, please leave them down below. I'll try to my best to answer them. I know I have a lot of followers from all over the world, and I want to make sure that I answer some of your questions. And you will understandably have a lot of questions and confusion around Canadian gun laws, and I'll do my best to try and explain them. There's another video that I was literally in the... Um, in the finishing stages of making that actually explained our gun laws to people who had no idea. And it was meant to be for generally for Canadians who were not well informed on our gun laws. And I want to make, wanted to make sure this was well before any talk of a ban started happening that I was trying to do my best to inform people and let them know what our gun laws are, what the restrictions are. And I kind of covered off a few of the pieces on this here, but a video is coming to hopefully explain it all. And um, hopefully you find it useful. Thanks for watching.